Look about right. Sorry, the cute little piggies. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and uh, dig in. So first of all, we just got done talking a little bit about the code, right? Um, and so we kind of went through that. Now, the other thing that we also noticed was that the, um, the genetic code is pretty much universal. So the same code that we have on the previous slide is exactly the same code that we would see in pigs or bacteria or us or mice. And one of the things, the reasons why this is a good thing. Well, so obviously if you have a common code, then the idea is that the, the ultimately that shows a sense of relationship between all of us, right? So that's kind of where you have the evolutionary concept of common ancestry. So as a result, just like members of your family share the same family traits because you all have common ancestry through your parents. Same thing's true here. We all have a universal code because we share common ancestry. And so that's kind of like one of the big sort of evolution uh, moments. <coughs> However, I would argue an even more important um, outcome of the universality of the genetic code is actually because it allows us to be able to do genetic engineering, which sounds kind of scary, but it's not. Um, so this is actually really how we've learned as much as we have, um, because one of the things that we noticed was that because bacteria have the same code as we do, then we can study genetic mechanisms in bacteria, and it'll have an exact one-to-one -one relationship to us. That is to say that there's really only a general design for life, right? There's like one basic design for life with lots of different bits and pieces and variations to it. Um, some of you guys may have remembered me playing Mozart in lab. Uh, several of you were like right into the speaker and probably would rather not remember that. But one of those things I, where I played was Mozart's variations on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, where you have one tune, but you have lots of variations, but it's basically still just one tune, right? So it's one melody. That's kind of what we have here when we basically are taking a look at this. So what we see with the universality of genetic code is we have really one pattern, one basic strategy for life. We just have lots of variations to it. That basically means that the things that we learn and discover in lower organisms, we can immediately apply to us. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, what that basically means for us is that we essentially get all of our biomedical engineering, right? So all those, those biomedical advances that we, we enjoy and take advantage of, could only have come a, around if this was true, right? Because I mean, last time I checked, you can't develop a therapeutic on humans. It's still considered unethical by most countries on this planet to experiment on humans, um, to see whether or not your therapy <laughs> actually works or not. And if it doesn't, then too bad. You just took one for science. Um, and if it does, great, right? So, we still can't do that, which basically means that we, if this wasn't true, then we would be still largely the dark ages when it comes to things like um, medical advancements. Because what that means is, like when we're developing a drug is a good example, right? So rather than just killing potentially hundreds of thousands of people by trial and error, because we're trying to figure out if this medication actually works, we can do that on low organisms, like mice, for instance. Right? That's the reason why we work on mice, not because we hate animals, PETA, I'm looking at you, right? But that's recorded by the way. So hopefully somebody from PETA is, is actually listening. Um, but the reason why we do it is because we know that the universality of the mouse genome is close enough to humans that if we can show a benefit in mouse, then likely that will actually transfer over to humans. Most of our drug development has come to us by that, by that way, okay? So we're not being mean, we're just trying to we're trying to solve genetic problems in us. And this is the only thing we have. And luckily the, the code is universal. So the lessons we learn in other organisms, we can immediately apply to us. And here's a good example, right? It kind of gets us to uh, what's called transgenics. And transgenics 
is uh, basically what you're doing is you're taking the gene of one organism and you're putting that gene in another organism. Now, this is a good example here. So this little piggy right here went to market. No, just kidding. Right, this little piggy right here, that's the transgenic pig. This is your normal pig. Now let's explain what transgenics mean and how this actually works. We're gonna to have to go back to chapter 10. Remember chapter 10 when we talked about proto-oncogenes and we talked about tumor suppressors. Remember, and I told you that we have basically your gene with your open reading frame here. You have your start site and you have your promoter. And here's some sort of a gene. And that gene is doing whatever it does, right? Uh, but one of the things we learned about was like, for instance, if a particular protein is expressed somewhere, like for instance, in this particular pig right here, we have a protein that's clearly expressed in the skin, right? So you can see the snout is yellow, the hooves are yellow, the fur is a little on the yellowish side as well. So this is a blonde pig. So the question is, how does the gene know to be made there, right? Before we used to think, oh, well, this is a, a product of the gene. And actually, it's not true. The pattern of expression is all bundled into the promoter and the regulatory region. And as a matter of fact, what's actually in the gene itself is irrelevant because everything is driven ultimately by the promoter region. So here's a good example of how we use this system. We us say we have a particular gene that we want to know about, like for instance, a skin gene, right? So we want to know, well, we got this gene. We're not quite sure. We think it's a skin gene, but we're not quite sure where it is. We're not sure when it's expressed or how much of it is expressed. Well, all those questions can be answered because what we can do is molecularly, we can, we can sort of rig this and we can put this promoter because now we know the promoter is the one who's responsible for the pattern, right? So the gene isn't on unless the promoter's on. So the promoter's either on or off and it's basically dependent on what that pattern is for the promoter itself. So what we do is we basically take the system and we keep the promoter, right? Because that's what's gonna give you your pattern. But then we put it behind or in front of what's called a reporter gene. And all a reporter gene is is some other gene that we've taken usually from some other organism. A good example of that would be like GFP, which is, uh, stands for green fluorescent protein. Uh, green fluorescent protein is actually a real protein. And uh, this was a protein that's actually made in jellyfish. This is what causes jellyfish to glow. And uh, you have to shine like UV light on it and then it'll glow back at you. But what we do is like, if we say, for instance, put GFP right here as our, as our reporter, then, and we put that back into the pig, then the pig's promoter is just gonna turn on and off just like normal. It doesn't know what, what's, what it's in front of. It just basically says, listen, this is where I turn on, right? This is, this is what I do. I turn on here for this long and then I turn off and I make whatever happens to be attached to me. So if that's the case, then what's gonna happen is everywhere that that promoter turns on or off, you're gonna be able to see now visibly because instead of having it hooked to your skin gene, you've got it hooked to a reporter gene that you can visit, visualize. And so then basically you essentially beam light onto like UV light onto your transgenic pig. And of course that excites the GFP molecule, which then fluoresces back its color. Um, and then this is what it looks like. So here you can probably see, this is likely probably a keratin uh, gene. Keratin is the, the gene of your skin, your nails and your hair. So you can see that's exactly the distribution that you would expect to see from keratin. But you can see now where the protein is normally expressed. And there's a lot of information that comes from that. And so we have used this actually quite a bit and it's actually really accelerated our knowledge of how genes are expressed and how they're used and how they're regulated when they're turned on, when they're turned off, where they're turned on, where they're turned off, at what time they're turned on in development and what time they're turned off in development. So we've, uh, this has allowed us really to understand a lot of information. Think of it this way for you football fans, right? Looking, being able to visualize and see where the protein is and when the protein is being expressed is a lot like watching a football team as they run a play. And so in order to understand what a particular player is doing, you have to sort of like watch them very closely. You have to watch them as they run their route, right? Do they make their break? Do they make their cut at the right time, right? Are they cutting in the right direction? Are they going outside or inside, depending on what the play is? So whenever you listen to football people when they're doing analysis at this particular time and evaluating players, they're always talking about, oh, you gotta watch the film. Well, what are they watching? 
they're watching these players as they're running these plays, but they have to be able to visualize these players and they can dissect and analyze whether or not they're a good player based on are they executing this play well. We do the exact same thing now that we can see the proteins. We can sit there and watch the proteins as they're normally behaving and we can determine whether or not, um, you know, what this means to the whole phenotype that we're looking at, okay? So that's a, that's a pretty common thing. As a matter of fact, that's been so useful and so helpful in uh, research that the individuals who originally um, developed the GFP system won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. So that's how important and how very uh, impactful this G GFP use has been. Uh, by the way, one of my all-time favorites, you can actually still Google this and see this, um, one of my favorites is the glow in the dark, glow in the dark tobacco plant, uh, which we generated in the 1990s with a similar sort of thing, different reporter. Uh, we used an enzyme called luciferase, which is the enzyme that's responsible for making fireflies glow. And so you feed it a substrate and then it'll break down that substrate and it'll emit energy in the form of light. And so what we did back in the 90s is we took some sort of a plant gene that's like everywhere in the plant, it's expressed everywhere in the plant, put it behind a luciferase and then we fed it its substrate and then we turned out the lights. And what you basically got was like a glow in the dark tobacco plant. It was pretty cool. I mean, from the roots all the way through its vasculature to its leaves, it's like, it was, everything was glowing. It was pretty cool. Uh, it's still one of my favorites. Look it up, Google it, glow in the dark tobacco plant. Um, that was one of my favorites, but that's kind of an example of what you can see when you're looking at this protein, you're asking yourself, well, wait a minute, where are you? Where do you do your job and how does that inform what I'm doing? Okay, so that's important. So now let's take a look at prokaryotic transcription, right? So we wanna understand prokaryotic transcription now before we get to eukaryotic transcription. Now in prokaryotic transcription, you have a single polymerase, that is a single RNA polymerase doing all the work. But of course, you're gonna have some events of initiation, which is always the case, right? So you have initiation, elongation, termination, the one thing that you require in a prokaryotic transcriptional event is you need your promoter, right? So your promoter is a, basically the primary recruiter for the polymerase. You need a start site. You need somewhere for the polymerase to be able to say, okay, this is where you begin. And then of course you need a termination site, right? So you need to be able to tell it when to stop. Notice this is a basic breakdown of our three set mechanism, isn't it? Initiation elongation, termination. And then you'll see that that's always true throughout. So let's take a closer look at the promoter piece of it. So when you take a look at the promoter, the promoter itself is the one that's responsible for recognition of the gene. So it's upstream of the start site and it is not transcribed because it's part of this regulatory region, which is not transcribed. So when you take a look at this, and, and we want to take a look, first of all, at the RNA polymerase, the holoenzyme. Now, holoenzyme, basically, whenever you say the term holo in front of it, what that basically means is kind of like big thing. Right? So usually when we use the term holoenzyme, uh, we're usually talking about uh, something where there's like one mechanism, right? One reaction, in this case, making RNA. But it's made by a complex, and the complex is big. So when the complex is big and it's a single enzyme activity, so the complex is like quaternary structure, but it's like a huge kind of a thing, then we usually could refer to it as a hollow enzyme. So the RNA polymerase itself has a couple of important uh, subunits. So you've got a couple of alpha, different types of alpha. So alpha and alpha prime subunits. You've got a beta and a beta prime. So that's these two green guys right here. Um, and then the important one is this little guy right here, sigma, which basically kind of forms like pincher fingers. These guys become important. So really, if you take a look at it, in a lot of ways, your core enzyme, right, alpha and beta subunits, oftentimes will just be sort of like the foundation upon which you can actually bind to your sigma. Now let's take a look and see what sigma does. So when you take a look at your DNA, right, you're taking a look at your gene region, 
one of the important things to uh, remember is we're going to start off, first of all, by defining it by start site. Now, the start site is defined as what we call, uh, refer to as plus one. All right, so this is the first nucleotide in the RNA transcript. Now, as you start to move uh, downstream, it becomes plus two, which is the second nucleotide, plus three, plus four, and so forth. Now, immediately to the left, upstream, so this, in this going down, this is what we refer to as downstream if you move to the right. If you move to the left, we refer to this as moving upstream. But if you move immediately upstream, you get to negative one. Negative two is the second one upstream, negative three, and so forth. So there's a numbering convention that we have where plus one starts the first nucleotide of the transcript. Okay. So that's your start site. Now the important, the reason why I say that is because the sigma subunit is designed and uh, built to attach to an area of the regulatory sequence that is at the minus 10 region. So that's 10 nucleotides upstream of the start site. This is what's referred to as the Tata box. This is basically consensus TA rich sequence. Now consensus sequence in DNA speak is essentially um, sequence that is for the most part always the same. So you can, you're gonna find it from gene to gene. You're gonna find it from organism to organism. So this is basically a type of sequence that's always there. As a matter of fact, when you take a look at genes, one of the ways that you find whether or not you're in the beginning of a gene or not, or whether you've identified a gene is by searching for the Tata box. Today, actually, when we do promoter searches in the lab, what we look for is the Tata box, a TA rich region that is immediately upstream of an open reading frame. We'll talk a little bit about open reading frame later. But this basically, this minus 10, this Tata box region is where the index finger of the Sigma subunit binds to. Okay. Now then what about the thumb? So the thumb region is gonna be binding to another kind of a, a TA rich region, but it's got a little bit of a TGC uh, rich region, which is at the minus 35. So, 25 more nucleotides upstream, and you're going to find the position where the thumb attaches. So you got the index finger attaching to the minus 10, the Tata box, the thumb attaching to minus 35, and then basically you're locating or you're binding your polymerase to the site of the promoter. Or these are promoter elements, these two elements, the minus 10 and the minus 35. So what happens once you're there? Well, what happens once you're there, which is uh, basically taking a look at the middle one. So that's where we have our index finger bound to the Tata box and then our thumb bound to the minus 35. So once you grab onto that with your index finger, your little pincher fingers, your Sigma subunit, then you're going to unwind your DNA at that point. So really what you're doing, if you just kind of take your pincer finger, your index and your thumb, what you're doing is you're grabbing onto your DNA on one side, your, your thumb is attaching on the other side, and then what you're doing is you're kind of like working that DNA open. So you're popping that DNA open. You don't have a separate protein here, like an unwindase, like a helicase to open it up for you. You're doing it yourself. So you just basically unwind. You don't need everything, by the way. You just need a little bit open just for you to be able to get access to it. So you just think, do a little bit of a twist, open it up a little bit with these pincher fingers, and then once it's open, then the beta subunit is able to maintain it and keep it open. And then the sigma unit will basically dissociate. So now here you can see the rest of the polymerase is now able to maintain what is now this transcription bubble. So it's like this little open bubble. And that is what you're going to basically use to get yourself started. Now notice all of these are events of initiation. Finding the promoter, unwinding it, getting that transcription bubble set. Now you start reading the template and you start building it. So this is your elongation step, right? 
So just like everything else, because of the three prime growing end, you're growing from five prime to three prime, right? So that's your, that's your direction. Um, in the transcription bubble, what are you gonna see? Well, you're gonna see RNA, right? So you're gonna see the RNA um, transcript that you're building and you're gonna see your DNA template. So you're gonna see both of those. That's gonna be inside the actual RNA polymerase. So the transcription bubble, unlike with replication, is inside the polymerase. And not only that, but once you pass through in the polymerase and you've already read that and you've built your transcript from it, then what you do is you rewind it as it leaves. So essentially what you have is you have your RNA polymerase, which is unwinding as it comes in, makes a copy of it, and then before it exits the polymerase, rewinds it back up. So if you were to see the system from the outside, you would actually never see unwound DNA because that is inside the polymerase, right? It's kind of like a little Tootsie Roll thing. So you got a little bit of a twist on one side, it's open in the middle and another little twist on the other side before it exits. So this is kind of what it looks like. So here you can see as it comes in, it's gonna be unwinding that DNA. Then it's gonna be basically making the RNA transcript. By the way, by the exact same process that you made DNA in the replication chapter, right? It's just a dehydration synthesis. In this case, you're using RNA nucleotides instead of DNA nucleotides. And then once it finishes its uh, transcript, it's gonna kind of thread it out and then it's gonna rewind your DNA before it exits. And then as it exits, you're gonna see you've got duplex DNA coming in, duplex DNA going out, and the bubble is inside the polymerase, nice and safe. So you don't have to worry about nucleases digesting your DNA, right? That's the reason why you don't have single-stranded binding proteins. That question usually comes up every semester. Well, how come you needed single-stranded binding proteins with replication, but you don't need it here? Because it's hidden inside the polymerase. But however, you do have single-stranded nucleic acid here, don't you? So you better protect your RNA because it's vulnerable, it's single-stranded. So you got to deal with this. We'll take a look at this here in just a second. Now, in prokaryotes, we had, there's a stop signal that tells the polymerase to stop. And so what this does is it basically stops the phosphodiester bond production. It'll kind of pause there for a second in the transcription bubble, and then eventually it'll release the DNA. And then oftentimes it'll create a hairpin, which protects the RNA, which is now single-stranded. It's kind of what it looks like. So here you can see you're terminated. So you got your termination signal. So, which is a bunch of uracils or U's in a row. So that's what you're seeing here. This is your poly U section. So that tells it to basically release. So you can see it's gonna basically fall apart here. Gonna release your DNA, which rewinds, gonna release your RNA template and the polymerase is gonna go off and look for another promoter to work with. But your RNA transcript is gonna be forming these hairpins. So here's your hairpin. You can see it forms a stem and this big loop right there. And that's gonna protect this end from nucleases. They're, they can't get a hold of that, okay? Because they need a loose end. So immediately, as soon as you make your RNA, you're trying to protect it. And that's an important thing. <clears throat> so here's a, an important, uh, kind of an interesting sort of a thing when it comes to prokaryotes. It's a coupled transcription translation. Think about it. In prokaryotes, everything is all basically tossed in the middle of the cell, right? Because they have no organelles. It's all in there. What about eukaryotes? Where would transcription be occurring in eukaryotes? Easier question than you think. What? No, that's translation. Megan, yes, in the nucleus, right? Because that's where your DNA is. So when you're doing transcription, you need your DNA for a template and your DNA is inside your nucleus. So transcription is happening in your nucleus, but where's translation happening? In the ribosome, which is where? It's outside the nucleus, right? 
So your transcription and your translation are spatially separated in eukaryotes. Why? Because you have your DNA sequestered inside the nucleus and your translation is happening outside the nucleus. So we cannot do coupled transcription and translation, but bacteria can because they don't have any compartmentalization. So here's what it looks like. So before transcription even begin, uh, be, even be, before it even ends, you already start translating. Because it makes a lot of sense, right? As you have a transcript coming out, it's like, well, hey, wait a minute, I've got code here. Why can't I just start working on it? Do I have to wait for it? Why can't I just start working on it? Well, if you're bacteria, the answer is you don't have to wait for it. You can jump right on there and start working on it before it's even done. And so the reason why this is important um, is because it basically helps to facilitate expression of genes in um, prokaryotes, which oftentimes are expressed together in groups called operons. So when you take a look at gene structure in bacteria, they're structured basically in units called operons. So these are units of multiple functionally related genes. So here's a good example. Let's say we have three genes involved in a biochemical pathway. Okay. In bacteria, they would organize them as one giant group, gene A, gene B, gene C, under the control of one promoter. So what would this do? Well, what this basically would do is if you turn the promoter on, then you're gonna make all three, right? You're gonna make a, basically an mRNA that's gonna have A, B, and C on. You're gonna have all three proteins. So you're gonna be making them all three at the same time. This is what's called a polycystronic mRNA because you have multiple genes on it. Now, the reason why this is helpful and useful is because you get to make all three of these enzymes and your biochemical pathway is immediately charged with enzymes. So you don't have to wait around for B to make it, right? So you, I just made a big bucket of A, now I'm waiting for B, now I'm waiting for C. It's like everything comes together all at the same time. And so you're able to really efficiently run your biochemical pathways. So this is basically what it looks like in prokaryotes. Now, what does it look like in eukaryotes? Well, we already know that one, right? In eukaryotes, it looks something like this. So here's A. Here's B with its own promoter. And then here's C with its own promoter. So in eukaryotes, every single gene is basically driven and expressed by its own promoter. This is a lot like having, here's a good example, the light switch in this room, there's one light switch that controls all of the lights in this room. That's like a prokaryote. If each one of these lights was a gene, then there's one promoter that's controlling all of them. They're either all on or they're all off at the same time. Well, it's helpful if we need them all on, but what if we need to create a little bit of an effect, right? What if we have some glare, we need the front lights off and the back lights on so you guys can see. Well, that's gonna require me to hook these up to different promoters, right? To different switches. And that's what eukaryotes can do, right? Because you can get different effects regulatorily speaking, if you have like more A, versus B and C, or more B versus A and C, or more C versus A and B. So you can attenuate how much of this you can use, and that creates a lot of different effects. Anybody who is into theatrical lighting will know that oftentimes the, the strategy for good theatrical lighting is about having a lot of infinite control over your lights, not just in dimness, but in location and in color and in hue, and so there isn't just a simple switch in theatrical lighting. Everything is modulated to like the nth degree. That's what creates all those really cool nuanced effects um, in theatrical lighting. So this is kind of what it looks like in bacteria. Because they can couple it, because they're all basically in the same gamish, then when they're kind of transcribing, so here you can see, here's an RNA polymerase that's transcribing a transcript. No, it's not even done with the transcript yet. And what happens? your ribosomes grab onto it and say like, listen, I'm gonna go ahead and get to work on this. You keep on making it, keep on spitting it out, but I'm gonna to get to work on this. And so what they do is as it comes out, they start to work on it. And then eventually they start to get their polypeptides growing out of the ribosomes. But guess what? 
if you haven't even start stopped, you haven't even, you haven't even finished transcribing yet. So this is the coupling of transcription and translation in prokaryotes. Something that they can do makes it very efficient because they can really belt out a lot of protein a very quick uh, amount of time. Something we can't do, right? So what's our trade-off? By wiring R, A, B, and C to different promoters, it gives us, uh, the upside of the trade-off is, it gives us a lot of control and nuance over the expression of A, B, and C that bacteria do not have. What's the downside? Basically, we can't make it all at the same time, right? We, we, we lack the efficiency of being able to couple transcription and translation, okay? So there's always a trade-off. What you gain on one side, you have to let go of on the other. Okay, and that's exactly the story of eukaryotic everything, pretty much. So now let's take a look at eukaryotic transcription. So transcription is actually quite similar to what it was in prokaryotic systems. However, and the, the difference between us is that we, instead of having one polymerase, we have three. So RNA pole one actually is responsible for transcribing ribosomal RNA, which we've already defined earlier in the chapter. Um, pole three, I mean, pole two is gonna be responsible for making mRNA, which is our dominant code, right? So that's our messenger RNA, and also snRNA, which is our spliceosome RNA. And then of course, pole three, they're basically gonna be making tRNA and other types of small mRNAs, like those regulatory RNA chunks. Now, each polymerase is tasked with making a specific mRNA. But remember, the RNA as it's being made is simply just like any other RNA. It basically starts off as DNA template. But the last time I checked, all DNA template is, regardless of where you are, is all just a series of A, C, Gs, and Ts. So how does a polymerase know that it's hooking itself up to an rRNA or an mRNA or a tRNA. How do you keep from getting a pole two from binding to a tRNA promoter? How do you keep from getting a mismatch? Well, basically what happens is recognition is driven by the promoter. That is to say promoters are specific to their polymerase. <laughs> it's not unlike you showing up to a family reunion and you're in an area maybe where there's like, it's like a big popular place and there's lots of different families, reunions and friends and parties going on. If you walk into the wrong family reunion, are you gonna notice that? I hope so, because otherwise you've got Alzheimer's. Right, I mean, you're gonna notice it's like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not related to any of you people. So sorry, didn't mean to crash your party, right? So basically you will, rec there's a sense of recognition, right? Between the two. So you're not going to be mismatched with the wrong family. The same thing's true here. The promoter is specific for the polymerase that is supposed to be there. As a matter of fact, the promoter's job is in the initiation events to recruit the correct polymerase to the site. That's part of the promoter's job. In eukaryotes, we have not just the promoter doing this, right? Because all promoter is DNA sequence. So the, the DNA sequence doesn't really have a lot of power to recruit um, big complexes like RNA polymerase. So what do we have in eukaryotes? We have a whole boatload of extra proteins that are helpers called transcription factors. These are basically um, part of the polymerase two entourage and they create what's called the initiation complex at the promoter. And then of course, uh, that's, it, that's uh, initiation. And of course we have elongation, which is simply just dehydration synthesis. So there's nothing mysterious or specially different about uh, elongation. Uh, and termination, however, one of the important things that's different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes and termination is that basically it's not sequence defined. It's not a sequence. <clears throat> so it does have a termination we just don't really know what it is it's kind of a little bit more amorphous in eukaryotes but they do know that they need to stop 
So let's take a look at the initiation piece of it. So the first thing that happens is these transcription factors, these sort of entourage proteins, basically, that what they need to do is they need to recognize the correct promoter. So they go immediately to the Tata -ta box, right? So the Tata -ta box basically is where the promoter is. That's the definition. That's the defining element for the promoter itself. And the very first transcription factor that, that binds typically is one that we refer to as TF2D, TF transcription factor two, because most of our studies of transcription have happened with Paul two. That's what two stands for. And then there's a whole host of transcription factors. This happens to be D. As it turns out, TF2D has two major domains to it. It's got a transcription factor binding domain. And it's got a Tata binding domain or TBP, the Tata binding protein. So your Tata binding domain is gonna be like right in here. And that's a region of the protein that's specifically designed to find that Tata box and bind to it. Once it does, then these transcription factor binding regions like here, here, and here, will then recruit all these other transcription factors, which will then come in and bind to the TFTD. So once the TFTD says, hey guys, I just found a Tata box, come here and bind to me, right? Then all these other transcription factors will come in, bind to TFTD, and it'll form a complex that looks something like this. Now the effect of these other transcription factors will essentially recruit the correct polymerase. But at this point, your transcription factor complex knows which polymerase that it needs to recruit, whether it's a Paul one, two, or a Paul three. And so what's defining that recruitment, that specific recruitment is oftentimes what's happening with these transcription factors. So like Paul one will have certain transcription factors that will recruit it to the site. Paul two will have certain other transcription factors. Paul three will have different transcription factors. So depending on which transcription factors come in here, each one of them will specialize in recruiting the correct polymerase. And then once you do that, the polymerase will bind to this region of the promoter, and then that forms your initiation complex. So now that you've got your initiation complex, you're ready for elongation, then you elongate, and then you terminate, okay? Okay, that's great. So what then? At this point, where are you in the cell? You're transcribing. You're assembling the initiation complex. Where are you in the cell? You're in the nucleus, right? And where do you need to be now once you're done with this process? You need to be in the cytoplasm, right? Where the ribosomes are. Because now that you've got the message, you need to go and make the protein, right? But guess what? You're not ready yet. Of course not, right? It's never that easy. <laughs> the sighs are heavy today. And the eyes are rolling viciously. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what do you first make? Um, you make what's called premature or pre-mRNA. You're not ready yet. Why? Because you got some problems with your mRNA, right? Your mRNA is how many strands does it have? Yeah, it's got one. And what happens to single-stranded nucleic acids in a cell? Yeah, they get eaten. If you send this thing out to the cytoplasm the way it is now, I mean, the Pac-Men on either side are waiting. The wolves are waiting to devour you. So guess what? You got to fix this, don't you? You got to do some protection. And so you do what's called RNA modification. So you got to modify your RNA. This is, by the way, RNA modifications are only happening in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes don't need any of this, right? It's only happening in eukaryotes. So what's the first thing to do? First thing they do is they basically form a five prime cap. It's a methylguanine cap and this protects it from degradation. 
It also is a binding spot for um, translation initiation. It's how the mRNA binds to the ribosome. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the initiation of translation. So this is going to basically block those five prime Pac-Men, right? But guess what? Your cis susceptible on the other side, aren't you? So you then add what's called a poly A tail. And so you just have a string of adenines and this has the effect of blocking those exonucleases. So it also acts as a signal for other types of RNA processing, but it's a really a protective thing. And then the last thing is basically you have to remove non-coding sequences. So here's the problem. A lot of times this throws students off a little bit. Um, here's the problem because what you're trying to do, and this is what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve what's called an open reading frame. And what an open reading frame is, is basically a continuous message that you can start and then read through without interruption all the way to the end. So that'd be like an open reading frame. That's not what you have when you do transcription. What you have are intervening sequences that are not coding called introns. So instead of an open reading frame, what you have is something that looks like this, something that will become part of the protein intervening with non-coding sequence, another piece of coding sequence, non-coding sequence, coding sequence, and so forth. So what you have to do is you have to remove those non-coding sequences and sew the coding sequences together. Think of it this way, by analogy, it's a lot like writing, remember our three letter sentence that we had earlier, right? The fat cat ate the big rat, right? So mostly what we do is we write three letter words, a space in between them, right? And then we have a sentence. The sentence begins with a signal, which is a capitalized letter at the beginning of the sentence, right? That tells you at the beginning of the sentence. And when does it tell you to stop? How do you know to stop? Yeah, terminal punctuation, right? Usually a period. So notice you have a start and you have a stop. In your genetic code, guess what? You have a start code on and you have a stop code on. But you notice what you also have is a continuous reading frame. That is to say that you can read each word back to back in a block without interruption and you can understand the sentence. But that's not what you get. What you get is something more like you write the first three letter word and then you mash the keyboard. And there's a bunch of random letters in there and then you write the next three letter word and you mash the keyboard and then you write another letter and you mash the keyboard. So what you have is the sentence that's sort of broken up by all these sort of random letters that aren't part of the sentence. So in order to understand the sentence, what you have to do is you have to go through and what? Delete out all of the random letters, right? In between. And then you put your words together and then you'll be able to read the sentence. So a sentence that has a beginning capital, terminal punctuation, and you can read it straight through without interruption is what's referred to as an open reading frame. So what you want to create is an open reading frame, something that you can start with your start code on, read it through, just start selecting your amino acid until you hit your terminal stop code on. But we have to remove those. And the way we remove it is by a process called splicing, which is driven by a complex that we refer to as the spliceosome. So there's several different members of the spliceosome. This is what it looks like once we finish it. Right, so here we basically have our five prime cap, which is protecting the five prime end, our poly A tail here. And then we have our open reading frame here in the middle if everything is all fully processed. But one thing we wanna do is we wanna take a little bit of a closer look at what this concept is of splicing. Right, because if I were to take a look at a pre-mRNA and I'm gonna put my coding sequence into boxes, just like I did before, uh, those coding sequences would be essentially what's referred to as exons. So I'm going to put an exon. I'm going to, I'm going to notationally depict it as a box. An intron, which is non-coding sequence, that is to say it doesn't become part of the amino acid. This is depicted as a line. So if I have a protein... I've got exon one with an intron 
exon two with an intron. Here's exon three, a big long one on that one. Short intron, exon four. There's exon five. So that's my original transcript, right? And then I've got a five prime cap over here and I got a poly A tail over here. So what the spliceosome has to do is basically cut out and remove these introns so that you can create a nice continuous open reading frame. So how does it do that? Well, it does that with SNRPs, which are small, not SMRFs, SNRPs, right? Which are um, small ribonuclear protein particles. Um, and so these are a basically a protein sRNA complex. Okay, so here's the problem. Well, last time I checked, it was the same problem with the promoter issue, right? Last time I checked, if you're just looking at RNA, it's all sequence. The exon sequence is just a bunch of ACGs and U's, right? The introns are just a bunch of ACGs and U's. So how do you know where an exon stops and an intron starts? How do you tell the difference? Well, again, the way you determine DNA is by consensus sequence. Remember, consensus sequence is typically non-altered sequence that acts like a signal so that you can define particular areas of DNA. One of those consensus sequences occurs at the beginning of every intron called the five prime splice site. And it starts with a consensus GT. And then the last three are usually variable. But every single five prime splice site starts with a consensus GT. What does that mean? That means every intron and every gene will have a GT at the five prime splice site. Every gene that has an intron, the introns will have a GT. And every organism and every eukaryote that has an intron, they will have a GT marking their five prime splice site. That's what we mean by consensus. It is invariable. We see the same pattern across genes. We see it across different organisms, okay? Okay, so that's great, but what about the other side, right? How do you recognize that one? Well, guess what? You're probably thinking there's another one there, and there is. There's a three prime splice side over here. And it's also consensus sequence. It's got three base pairs coming up, followed by a consensus AG. So the three prime side is marked by a three prime AG. So you'll have a GT, AG, GT, AG, GT, AG, GT, AG. When you see that combination, GTAG, you've got yourself the boundaries of an intron. By the way, there's one other consensus element, the branch site. There's a consensus adenine. It's always there at the branch site. It's usually right about there. We'll talk about what that branch site is doing here in just a second. So you have three different consensus elements to recognize. If you see a GT and an AG with a branch site in the middle, guess what? You've got yourself an intron. That's gonna be true for all introns. So these are the recognition elements that the SNRPs are looking for. And when they find them, what they're gonna do is they're gonna go through a process to cut out these introns. So here's what it looks like ultimately. So here's your DNA template with your introns in them. It's going to produce a primary transcript with those introns in them. But the problem is you got to cut these guys out. So you got to snip these out, these purple parts. And so basically that's what the splice symbol do. So it snips these out. It sews together your exons, which are the yellow parts, and that creates your open reading frame. So this is your or. You can start at the beginning, go to the end without interruption, and you don't have to stop. That's your open reading frame. That's what you're trying to produce. So this one is now ready. for translation. Oh, but we're not done with splicing yet, are we? It's not that it's not that easy. So this is kind of what it looks like. If you're just wondering, this is actually a real shot, a real electron micrograph of these loops and things like that that are created 
by the spliceosome itself. So you can see basically what the spliceosome will do is it kind of like grabs onto the RNA and then you kind of pulls everything together and kind of loops them together and starts to work on them. So let's actually see what it does. So there are basically uh, U1 through U6. That's kind of what these SNRPs are designated as. So uh, there's six of these in the overall spliceosomal complex labeled U1 through U U6. And they have different tasks. Uh, the first one, its job is to recognize the five prime splice site. That's actually done by U1. Um, and how does it recognize it? Because the snRNA, this is where the importance of snRNA comes in, has a complementary piece to it, to the five prime splice site. So the snRNA is there to recognize the five prime splice site. That gets the U1 identifying the boundary. And then there's other proteins that will come in here and then they'll recognize U1. And then a couple of them will recognize the branch sites. Um, and there's several different players that are involved in branch site recognition. But once you do this, then what's gonna happen is these two guys are gonna associate. So they're gonna come to each other and they're gonna pull the RNA together in the process and kind of create this big loop. So as these two guys come together and associate with each other, it creates this big loop. The rest of the RNA in between loops out. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut these exon boundaries and you're gonna attach the five prime side to the branch site. That's basically why the branch site is there. So the branch site, basically the five prime splice site attaches to the branch site. And so here you can kind of see what's happening. So here you can see your five prime splice site is attached to the branch site. And now you've got like this little lariat structure, which will then go off and get degraded. But you have two loose ends now, don't you? So now what happens is the rest of your spliceosome will take one exon and seal it to the other exon, gluing those guys together. And this is what you get. So you get your two exons, which are sealed together. You get your lariat, which then goes and gets degraded, and your spliceosome goes and does it all over again. Seems like a little bit of a headache, yes? Why in the world would you carry to want to do this? Seems pretty inefficient. Well, they're doing it to make your lives harder. That's why they're doing it. Because otherwise, biology would just be too easy. I mean, we got to make it more complicated. Right, because otherwise I justify their existence. No, that's actually <laughs> that's actually not the reason why they're doing it. But there's a really good reason why, right? And here's the reason why. Think about it, for instance. First of all, when we first discovered introns, the one thing that we knew that was crystal clear was first, we there they don't exist in bacteria. Bacteria and prokaryotes do not have introns. So all this stuff we've been talking about, five prime capping, poly A tailing, splicing. None of that happens in prokaryotes. All of that is pure eukaryotic innovation. Now, originally, we used to think that they are ancient viral invasions. Right, because they all kind of look roughly the same. And uh, a little bit of virology, one of the things you'll notice in virology is that usually when you get infected with the virus, one of the things they do is when they go through integration, they take their genome and they insert it into yours. And that's, and then it sleeps for a while, right? Um, and it kind of stays there undetected until something triggers it to start coming back to activate. It's what's called the, the lysogenic cycle. And it becomes a problem again. A perfect example of this is chickenpox. Right. I mean, how many of you guys have had chickenpox? Not the vaccine for chickenpox, but actually had chickenpox. Right. Well, you have the chickenpox virus in you. It's been integrated into your genome. And it's just sleeping there. Now, what happens if it comes back out? Well, we basically have the lysogenic cycle. So it, that's not chickenpox when it comes back out. It's shingles. Right. So when people are talking about getting shingles, that's because that virus has been in your genome, integrated in your genome, hanging out there for most of your life. And then for one reason or another, it comes back out, comes back active, and then you end up getting shingles. 
And so that's what they were thinking. This happened here. They said that the, in, these introns were ancient viral genomes that basically plopped into genes. Um, and of course, that would have been random integration, um, which then accumulated in, um, in eukaryotes. And, and that was kind of what they are because they all kind of look very similar. Because what we saw was that we don't really have any sensibility. It's not like it doesn't seem to be a rule that governs how many are there. Like, for instance, we have some genes don't have any introns at all. Uh, some can have buckets of introns. I mean, like 50 introns, that's a lot of introns. That's like your gene is mostly intron, is mostly non coding at that point if you got 50 introns. But it seems to suggest random integration, which is what you would expect from an ancient viral invasion because some genes got lucky and they didn't get integrated into and other genes got very unlucky and they got integrated into. And so this seemed to suggest and support our ancient viral genome, but there's a problem. We're kind of moving away from that now because if you think about it, think about how many, gene, how many invasions you would have to have, right? Most genes have introns. Um, I would say some have up to 50. And if they're all randomly integrating, just th think about that for a second. How likely is it that a eukaryote, a eukaryotic genome would survive if it had that much global random integration? That's like a genetic mortar shell. If you mortar shell a city too much, is it gonna be a functional city anymore? Ask Dresden, right? The bombing of Dresden, that pretty much did absolutely annihilated that city, right? So here's, and that, that's the problem, right? Because it, it's, it's, it would be random integration. And so you may be able to survive one integration event, but to have potentially millions and millions of integration events coming at you, and then to have a functional genome after that is like so remote. It's like worse than the probability of getting two U's on this planet ever. And so that's a huge problem, right? Because even statistically, it's like, and, and, the, whole, and the whole thing is like, oh yeah, but we're the end point. So we're the one that actually happened. We're the lightning in the bottle. Bull dunk, Let, let's actually use our brain and go back and think about whether or not this is even mathematically possible, right? Because when I hear people say that, every year biology say that, what I hear them saying is basically they're, 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 they're essentially um, willing to support magic and mysticism because after all, this is miraculous stuff, right? So that's what I look at. So if you take a look at this mathematically, does it make any sense whatsoever to have this many random integration that are essentially blowing up the genome every single time they integrate it and to still have a functional genome after the fact? Is that likely gonna happen? No. And you know what, to even make that point even worse, what we noticed is when we started studying it is we noticed that the exons aren't just random chunks of survivors left over. They're actually organized into functional domains. So a DNA binding domain will, for instance, be an exon one. A protein binding domain will be an exon two. So what this basically shows is this shows intention and organization of the genome. There's no other way around it. You didn't just randomly throw shells at the genome, which is what a viral invasion does. There was intentional segregation of the genome into exons, into specific domains. So that basically means that the inclusion of introns was a very intentional strategic movement in order to organize the genome in a way that would give you maximum um, expression. So there's what we're saying here is that there, there is a, an intentional mechanism behind doing this. Notice, and the, that's the one big theme that I always try to drive home, is that when the more you study biology, the more you realize that um, randomness is not part of the game. Everything in biology screams intentional delivery because random is expensive and hard to come by, right? 
So usually when you see something like this, it means like, no, 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 you didn't just get blasted by a bunch of introns randomly. You actually placed those introns in there because you were trying to specifically organize your genome with your exons as functional domains. Why? Why would that matter? What would be the strategy to that? Well, there's actually even more that goes along with that. And that is alternative splicing. Okay, so what's alternative splicing? Let's take a look at alternative splicing. All right, I'm gonna go back to my original one because I already drew it and uh, I drew it with that in mind. So this guy right here, a lot of times students will be like, okay, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so if a spliceosome recognizes the five prime splice site every GT and then pairs that up with an AG, then it should look something like this, right? It should say, it should cut that one out and pair that one and that one, and that one and that one, and that one and that one. And then what you should get is exon one there, a little nib of exon two, a really long exon three there, right? That's gonna sew together, gonna add a four there, and then a little nip of five, right? That's your open reading frame. <clears throat> but wait, can a GT be paired with a different AG? Like for instance, can this GT here be paired with this AG down here? And the answer is there's no rule that says the GT has to be paired with the immediate AG. You can pair this GT to this AG down here. What would happen if you did that? Well, what you would have is you would have exon one with a little nib of exon five. So what happens if you paired this GT with this AG right there? So in that case, you would have exon one, X on four and X on five, another open reading frame. So these basically are what's referred to as isoforms. Three different proteins from one transcript, one gene. And wait a minute, there was. So the other axons, they become part of the lariat, Megan, and they get degraded. So that's a big deal, right? Because now all of a sudden, your introns aren't just like random holdovers of evolution, some random integration of viruses. By the way, usually what I've noticed is whenever evolutionists make that kind of a conclusion, where this is like a vestigial thing that's an, an evolutionary holdover that's no longer useful, that's almost always wrong. Eventually, that almost always becomes wrong because what happens is later on, we actually start to understand its function better. And we realize, no, this actually isn't an evolutionary holdover. This has actually got a function now, right? So that's almost always wrong. So I'm not a big fan of the whole vestigial, you know, evolutionary holdover argument. I think that's one of the stupidest arguments that evolutionary biologists ever make. And they do, they love to do that one. It drives me insane. That's usually because they haven't figured out what it actually does. That's usually the case. But here now you can see that what you have are three different proteins for the price of one transcript. So what have you done? You've tripled your productivity. That's actually really good. That's a good strategy. All of a sudden now, it looks like introns are a really clever strategic strategy in order to generate a lot more protein from fewer transcripts. Doesn't really look like introns are really all that random integrating now, does it? It looks like they are a very intentional strategic development in trying to understand and develop the genome. This really hit home to us when we did the, um, the Human Genome Project, because what we did was we essentially, um, what we wanted to know is we wanted to know how many genes does it take to make us, right? And we were thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to take hundreds of thousands of genes, potentially millions of genes. I mean, look at us. I mean, we are awesome. Aren't we great? Um, 
So some of you are like, yes, I am. But um, <laughs> right, but the idea is we're thinking like, I mean, this is an unknowable amount. This is like a huge number of genes that's involved there. And then we went through and we did the human genome project. And we realized that in reality, there's like maybe 20 to 30,000 active genes that makes you. That, by the way, if you're like a genomics person and you're looking at that one, the first thing you do when you look at that number is you're desperately trying to pick your jaw up off the floor. Because not only were you off, but you were off by orders of magnitude. I mean, you were hundreds of thousands of genes off. And so a lot of times people would be like, well, wait a minute, how come it's so low, right? This, was blo this blew us away how low this number was. Well, the reason is because of alternative splicing. Because when we take a look at it, uh, there's a lot of genetic disorders that are splicing mutants, a good 15% of them. And when we take a look at the genes themselves and we see how they're being expressed, it ranges between a third to two thirds of your genome has some type of alternative splicing to it. So in reality, alternative splicing is actually more the norm rather than the exception. That is to say that most genes are probably putting out not just one protein for transcript, but they're probably putting out multiple versions of their transcript in these multiple isoforms. And you're getting double productivity or triple productivity or sometimes even quadruple productivity. So because of that, then you're able to generate nearly hundreds of thousands of mRNAs for the price of a fraction of that many transcripts. Not only that, but what really drove alternative high splicing home in terms of its importance, because before we used to actually think, before the human genome project, like in the 80s and 90s, we used to think alternative splicing was irrelevant. This is actually, we are still thick in, the, in our head, basically. Um, and we, we thought, oh, well, you know, introns are irrelevant because they're not coding, so they don't make protein, so nobody cares about them. And none of that, but we have an entire mechanism to cut them out and throw them in the trash. So what kind of, you know, what is that? So splicing is not a big deal. Alternative splicing was driven home as in terms of importance, actually, in the late 80s, early 90s, when we did an experiment, very simple one, an observation, really between UC Davis and UC Berkeley, Jerry Rubin's lab and, and Ken Burtis' lab. And Ken Burtis' lab was actually right next door to the lab that I worked in, the meiosis lab that I worked in. Um, and he worked on fruit flies. He worked on sex determination in fruit flies. And what they noticed in uh, fruit flies is that there was a protein that was responsible for determining the secondary sex characteristics of male and females, right? So basically there was a protein called double sex. There was a male version and then there was a female version. If you took double sex M and you put it on a fly, it would turn it into a male. It would visibly be a male, okay? If you had double sex F and you put it on a fly, it would turn it into a female. So her secondary sex characteristics and her tissue development would turn into female. But here's the problem. Obviously we wanted to take a look at the gene that encoded these. And we were thinking these are separate genes, right? There's a gene in the males and there's a gene in the females, but what we actually turned out was that they actually are the same gene double sex that encodes both of them. And it turns out the double sex, the transcript from double sex is alternatively spliced. In males, it is the isoform is the male version of double sex. And in females, the isoform that's, that's spliced there is the female version of double sex. But it's coming from the exact same gene, double sex. That's common to the both of them. So this basically really drove home for the first time in the geneticist minds that splicing isn't just cutting out the junk and throwing away the trash. That there's actually very significant biology in alternative splicing, none more so than sex determination in fruit flies. I mean, here you had an alternative splicing event that determined whether a fly was going to be a male or a female. That's pretty consequential biology, right? You're not just throwing out the trash with that one. And of course, later on, we found out that alternative splicing is, is a pretty big deal. Okay, so now that we know a thing or two about transcription and modification of those mRNAs, um, let's go ahead and um, start defining translation. We're going to be, first of all, taking a look at 
the tRNA molecule and ribosomes themselves, and then we'll start to move forward to our initiation, elongation, and termination processes there. First thing we want to do is define our tRNA um, molecule. Generally speaking, uh, the tRNA molecule will basically be a kind of a cruciform structured uh, molecule. And on one side, you're going to have what's called an anticodon. And the other side is going to be an acceptor site, which attaches to the amino acid. So you have the acceptor stem of the amino acid. And of course, you're going to have your anticodon loop that is complementary to the mRNA. So who's responsible for making this tRNA, right? Because the tRNA itself is basically a series of stems and loops uh, that are all kind of wad and kind of folded up on itself. But how do you go about the process of actually taking the correct anticodon, which is complementary to the codon on mRNA, that's why it's called an anticodon, and how you make sure that that anticodon is tethered to the correct amino acid, right? Remember, Nuremberg found out that UUU, that is the codon, mRNA codon, UUU, was encoding an, a phenylalanine. On the anticodon, that would be not UU, it would be what? Because complementary, it would be yeah, yeah, it'd be AAA, right? So the question is, how do you know that that is linked to the correct amino acid, in this case, phenylalanine? That process of assigning the amino acid to the tRNA is done by this enzyme here, which is a very important enzyme, amino tRNA synthetase. And so we're gonna take a look at the structure and some of the mechanism of amino acyl tRNA synthesize here just a little bit. So this kind of a tRNA is various uh, versions of how you can look at tRNA. You can see that basically it is just uh, a single stranded RNA that's folded on itself and all these stems and loops. And by the way, these stems and loops here, these are actually quite important because these are essentially uh, binding to the ribosome. That's what those are there for. On one end, you have the acceptor site where you're going to have your amino acid. On the other side, you're going to have your anticodon um, loop, which is then going to be identifying the mRNA. This is your ribbon model, this is your space fill, but this is your cartoon model. So, this is the one that we're likely going to be using for the rest of the chapter. Okay. So, we have your acceptor site up here, and you have your anticodon down here at the bottom. So, let's take a look first of all at charging the tRNA. How do we actually go about the process of getting the right uh, amino acid associated with the right tRNA with the correct anticodon? Well, this assignment is all done by the amino uh, CL tRNA synthetase. So this is the one that assigns the correct amino acid to the correct anticodon. You're gonna need energy to do this. Nothing comes for free. And we're gonna take a look at this mechanism here in a stepwise process. But the first thing that I want to really zero in and make sure I drive home is this piece right here. Oftentimes students get this false impression that as the tRNA comes into a ribosome, somehow the ribosome checks down to make sure it's the correct one. Nothing like that happens. Quality control does not happen with the ribosome. You can feed the ribosome some squirrely crazy thing that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And all it'll do is it'll take that whatever you give it and attach it to the growing polypeptide chain. So who ensures that the amino acid assignment to the anticodon is correct? That would be the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. This is basically your quality control. This is the only one. And this is the only time when you double check to make sure that your assignments are correct. After this, once the tRNA is changed, all it does is just deliver it. And the ribosome just takes whatever you deliver and just adds it. And that's all it does. So it's only this enzyme that actually makes sure that this attachment is correct. So that means then there's a lot of pressure on this enzyme to get it right. So here it is. Let's take a look at it. So the amino acyl tRNA synthetase has two different um, active sites. The first one is going to be a pocket that's designed to bind to its amino acid. In this case, we're going to be using tryptophan as our example. The other major site is a tRNA 
site itself. So the first event that's gonna happen is you're gonna hydrolyze your ATP. You're gonna lose your um, two phosphates as pyrophosphate. And then what's gonna stay behind is AMP, right? Adenosine monophosphate. So that one phosphate stays behind on the adenosine, but that allows you to be able to connect your tryptophan to its active site. From here then, you're gonna recruit the tryptophan tRNA into its uh, active site, and it's gonna basically fit right into that pocket. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So here you can see, you're gonna hydrolyze your ATP. That then is going to allow tryptophan to bind to its active site here. And then that will potentiate the binding of the tRNA. Now, here's a good question that a lot of times students will ask. Well, wait a minute. When I look at this, all you're saying is that there's a pocket here for tRNA. But there's a lot of different tRNAs, right? There's a lot of different tRNAs with a lot of different anticodons. So how is it that you make sure that the tRNA that's binding in the site isn't the phenylalanine tRNA or the alanine or the glycine tRNA? How do you know that it's only the tryptophan that will bind there and not some other tRNA? How does the correct tRNA bind to its site? That's the question. The answer is quite simple. Induced fit. Okay, so let's review what induced fit is. Um, induced fit is an enzymology uh, a term, and it's a mechanism, right? So the idea with induced fit is that whenever a substrate, like for instance, tryptophan here, binds to its active site, we always think of that active site as sort of like being a predetermined pocket, right? Like a pre-carved out space that happens to fit your shape. Very similar to like square hole, square peg. Right? That would be like a lock and key type of a scenario, but that's actually not the way most enzymes work. Most enzymes work by what's called an induced fit mechanism. What does that mean? That means that most of these active sites are like beanbag chairs. Does a beanbag chair have a predetermined shape? No, it's just an amorphous blob, right? Well, then how does it manage to allow you to sit in it so comfortably? Because as you sit in it, what happens is the beanbag chair molds around your body and your body literally is inducing the shape of the hole that fits to you, right? So you're basically inducing your own hole into the beanbag chair as you sit in it. So the beanbag chair is taking on the shape of your body. So the same thing happens with enzymes. When the tryptophan binds to the amino acyl tRNA synthetase, what it does is it creates an induced fit that is imposed on the tRNA site. So it's only receptive to the tRNA or tryptophan. So the tryptophan actually induces the shape of the tRNA that it goes to. It's almost as if the tryptophan or the amino acid will basically make its own selection. The shape that I'm inducing on amino acyl tRNA synthetase is only going to be for the anticodon that's associated with tryptophan. So that is the way that you get a tight linkage between the tRNA anticodon and the amino acid, because you use the amino acid in an induced fit type of mechanism to essentially select and only select that correct tRNA. Okay. Then what your tRNA is bound, then you're gonna be ready to attach your amino acid to the acceptor site, which happens once AMP leaves. And then at that point, then you have recharged your tRNA and you're ready to go deliver it. Notice you do it again, but now you can grab a different uh, amino acid. 
So you can grab a different amino acid, which will then induce the shape differently. So let's say, for instance, you use phenylalanine. Phenylalanine will come in here, and its shape inducement will only be so for the shape of the phenylalanine tRNA. Okay. Good. So let's take a look at the ribosome. So the ribosome basically is um, a two subunit structure with multiple active sites in it. So these are the major active sites in it that we're going to be taking a look at. So the first one is the P site. Um, I remember this because it has the polypeptide in it. So this has the growing polypeptide chain in it. Then we have the A site, which um, I think of as arrival. So this is where the arrival and the new amino acid is coming in from the tRNA that's coming in. So tRNA is delivering its new amino acid into the A site. And the E site is what's called the exit site or the ejection site. This is where that um, empty, this is where the uncharged tRNA is ejected to go get charged again. Where? The amino seal tRNA synthetase. So when you take a look at it, you can see you've got your small subunit, which will basically come together. And when it gets capped by the large subunit, it's gonna create these three active sites, EPA. So E on this side, P in the middle, and A on the other side. Once you get that, you're ready to roll. You're ready to go. So um, this is the ribosome. This is a big deal. We actually did this and we, a lot of fanfare associated with this one, but we finally figured out the structure of the ribosome. The important thing about the ribosome, however, that uh, you want to always keep in front of you is the ribosome, remember, doesn't do any quality control. It only does really one thing. That's peptidyl transferase. Basically, all it does is transfer the growing polypeptide chain to the new amino acid. That's all it does. Okay, that's literally all it does. It just makes that extra peptide bond, adds the new one to the existing chain. So let's take a look at translation. Uh, we're gonna take a look at what it looks like in prokaryotes so we can get our uh, foundation and we're gonna compare that into eukaryotes where it's gonna get really cool. Um, so ultimately, remember you always start off with initiation. And so for um, translation in prokaryotes, the initiation complex starts with a couple of things. First of all, you need your initiator this is your first tRNA, so you need this one. Typically, it's always the same. It's an N-formal methionine. It's always the same one. Why? Because your start codon is always the same, right? Um, you need your small ribosomal subunit, and then of course, you need your mRNA strand. Now, you need to put all these guys together. And so what you have is in your mRNA, the question is, well, wait a minute, if you're assembling your small ribosomal subunit, and your mRNA, how do you know where to attach to, right? So how do you know where your start codon is? Well, in bacteria, we have what's called an RBS, a ribosome binding sequence. It's actually a specific sequence, a very small one. This is kind of like the binding signal. For the small subunit. So what happens is you basically have your small subunit, you have your RBS is gonna bind and you're gonna have your mRNA here and you're gonna assemble your first tRNA and then you cap the um, ribosome with your large subunit and that's gonna create your site. So here's what it looks like. So here's your small subunit. So you're gonna have your mRNA. And so you're gonna have a little bit of a leader there. This is where your RBS is gonna be, that signal. And so that's gonna to bind to your small subunit. Notice you have initiation factors. So these are helper proteins that help to sort of guide the mRNA to the correct locality. Your initiation tRNA will come in and bind to that initial AUG, which is going to be right here. But notice who's carrying it along. Another initiation factor is kind of helping transport it to where it needs to go. Remember, nothing, none of this is random, right? You don't have these three things just sort of floating around randomly and they just happen to bump into each other. 
and form initiation complex. You have proteins whose job it is to make this happen, right? So you have an initiation, you have initiation factors who say, listen, I'm going to grab onto you tRNA and I'm going to escort you to your to where you need to be. I'm going to put you on your mark, right? Just like every great theatrical performance, you know, people who are starting off a scene, they are just set, standing in, in a random place, just randomly, right? There are stagehands that are saying, listen, your mark is on the X. Stand on your mark, right? Because you need to know where you need to be in order for the scene to work. And so the same thing is true here. There are invisible stagehands, if you will, that are busy making sure that everybody is coming together the way they need to. So once you get these three together, so here you can see your initiation tRNA, which is basically tethered to your AUG, which is your start codon. Okay, so far, so good. You have your mRNA well embedded and bound by the small subunit. Now you're ready to cap it with your large subunit, which puts your first initial tRNA in the P site. And now you're ready for elongation. So this is basically initiation of translation. What about in eukaryotes? Well, it's similar, except instead of an N formal, it's just a methionine. That's our initial amino acid. Uh, we have a little bit more going on in the initiation complex. So we have more players, imagine that. None of that, but we don't have an RBS. So what do we use? Our five prime cap. So not only is the five prime cap protecting us from degradation, but it's also where eukaryotic small subunits will bind in order to, to get them established in the initiation complex. But otherwise, same basic idea, right? You cap it with a large subunit, you create an EPA site, very similar. So those are events of initiation, right? Now what about elongation? Well, if you take a look at elongation, first of all, that first amino acid is in the P site, right? So what does that mean? That means the A site is empty, but this is basically where the new tRNA will arrive. So what do you do? You read the codon, right? And then you find the matching tRNA that is complementary to that codon. That tRNA will come in. It's usually escorted again, right? Invisible stage hands, making sure you're on your mark. So in this case, the escort is EF2, right? Elongation factor two that will actually bind to the tRNA and basically center it on its spot. And helps the tRNA find the codon. And then once it finds the codon, then you form the peptide. So this is your peptide transfer between the amino acid that's already there, which is methionine, and the new one that just came in. So now where you had one, you now have two amino acids. And you spring in the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. And there's a cycle to this. And here's what the cycle looks like. So the first cycle is what's called codon recognition. <clears throat> this is where the new tRNA arrives at the A site. So here you can see you basically got your exposed codon, it gets red. So your elongation factor, right? Your EF2 will bring your tRNA that's complementary, and basically it'll arrive at the A site. So this is your codon recognition. You're recognizing or reading that empty space codon. And then these elongation factors will exit and they'll go grab another tRNA. Now what's happened? Now, basically you've got codon recognition. You've got the new tRNA in the A site, the old one is in the P site, and now that begins step two. Peptide transfer. 
And here what happens is the chain of amino acids is moved behind and linked to the new amino acid. So notice what happens here is you have your new amino acid that's sitting right here. So here's the new guy. Here's your existing chain. What happens in peptide transfer is that basically the chain will actually move behind the new guy. So now this is this was one and two. So now one and two becomes behind it. So what happens is it's different than the way we form a line, isn't it? If we come to a growing line, where do we go? To the front of the line? Yeah, if you go to the front of the line, you're gonna get your butt kicked, right? Um, you go to the back of the line. So the line gets longer by adding to the back. In peptide transfer, what happens is the line gets longer by, by adding the line behind you. So like if you were an amino acid and you showed up, then what would happen is the line would get behind you. So the person who comes in at the last second is the person who's in the front of the line. That's how the transfer works. But now notice that tRNA that's in the middle now no longer has anything, right? It's uncharged. And the one that's in the A site is, has the polypeptide chain right now, doesn't it? Well, guess what? They're out of place. Right, because that A site's supposed to be empty. If you have the polypeptide chain, where should you be? Your assigned seat is the P site, right? The polypeptide site. So what happens now? Translocation. Here you advance the mRNA in order to expose the new codon. So basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna move it all this direction. That means the uncharged tRNA is gonna to go to the E site. The one that's right now in the A site carrying the polypeptide chain will shift over to the P site and then that'll open up the A site. So now notice you have an empty A site, your polypeptide is again in the P site and then your E site is full of the empty tRNA which gets ejected and then that goes to get recharged to amino acyl tRNA synthetase. And it comes back and then it waits for its chance to enter into the next codon according to what that codon is. So remember, these are events of elongation, right? Codon recognition followed by peptide transfer followed by translocation and you go all over again. Then you recognize the next codon in line. Then you do peptide transfer and then translocation. And this kind of what it looks like up close and personal. So here you can see the peptide transfer. So you can see that you've got a new tRNA inside the A site. So what's gonna happen is amino acid one, which has your C terminus here, your N terminus here, that's the amino and the acid part of it. What's gonna happen is the nitrogen is actually gonna attack the C. And so this guy basically goes behind. So that becomes the new peptide bond right there. So this becomes what's called your C terminus. And then this end part right here becomes your N terminus. And that's true for every protein. You have a C terminus where you have your acid portion and you have your N terminus where you have your amino portion. And you keep doing that until what? Until you hit your stop codon, right? Now there is one kind of weird thing that we noticed actually in translation, something that we call wobble pairing. And so what we noticed was that when you take a look at an anticodon codon pairing, right? So if this is like your anticodon, let's say this is A, U, U. What we noticed is that the first two are very stringent. These two are stringent pairing between anticodon and codon. But this one here is less stringent. So what does that mean? So this basically can be a UA pairing like normal, or it can be like a UG 
or a UC, et cetera. It can tolerate other things that are technically be a mismatch, but it allows you to have a little bit of slop in that third wobble. This kind of gives us a little bit more flexibility so that we don't have to have so many tRNAs. We can pair up fewer tRNAs with our codons. It's kind of an odd sort of a, like a flexibility there. Of course, in translation, termination is super simple, right? Because you get stop codons. What were they? UGA, right? UAG, then AUU. So here's basically um, a stop codon. So what happens then is once you kind of shift over, if your stop codon enters the A site, then what'll happen is a release factor will come in there, but you notice there's no assigned amino acid here. So you can't do peptide transfer now. You did codon recognition, but now you get stalled out of peptide transfer because there's no protein, there's no amino acid there to move over. There's nothing to peptide transfer to. And so what happens is it, fall, it causes everything to fall apart. That's what dissociation is. And then you release your peptide and then off you go into your protein folding. And then what happens? Your ribosome falls apart and then you basically go and reinitiate. So that's your termination. Um, so we're getting, uh, this is, we're about ready to start a new, uh, topic. It's going to take a little bit of time. There's a lot of words that I want to make sure I get across. Um, and we're just about at our witching hour. So I don't want to go over. Um, so we're just a few minutes shy. So I'm willing to stop it there and begin with protein targeting on Wednesday. And uh, we'll easily finish out uh, chapter 15 um, on Wednesday. Okay. Um, also, that is right, Megan. Yes, it is indeed the last lecture. Um, yeah. Celebration is certainly, an, uh, is certainly appropriate. Um, <coughs> also, remember also other than lecture, we don't have any lab because we're already done. Yes, we already took the lab exam. <laughs> um, so there's no lab so basically once we're done with lecture we're pretty much done with the semester and we're just preparing for monday the 8th which will be our last lecture exam here in person sound good okay. but we're almost there All right we're almost done so let's go ahead and, uh, and call that a day, shall we?